There. Okay. There you are. Okay. Hey, everyone. Great. Okay. So let me tell you about Riva. Riva Lair is an artist, writer, and curator whose work focuses on issues of physical identity and the socially challenged body. Bless you. She's best known for representations of people with impairments and those whose sexuality or gender identity have long been stigmatized. She's a longtime faculty member of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And she is also an instructor in medical humanities at Northwestern University, I'm assuming the medical school. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, you can look at um, all of her artwork, which I recommend. And the um, website address is Riva Lair Art. Uh, com. And you should go buy this book um, from an independent bookstore. I, uh, Riva will read from her book soon, but I wanted to set up the story because Golem Girl, do you want to say something? No, oh, I was going to offer to read the, were you going to read the Golem story or? Just the, just, just the beginning of the prologue. Just, yes. Oh, so just go right. Go just for it. Just parts of the, okay. So this is the prologue of the book. The Latin roots of monster are monier, meaning to warn, and monstrum, an omen, or a supernatural being that indicates the will of a god. Monster shares its etymological root with premonition and demonstrate. My first monster story was Frankenstein. <clears throat> Golem, or goylem in Yiddish, is a Hebrew word for shapeless mass and first appear, appears in Psalm 139 of the Hebrew Bible in which Adam is referred to as a gol, golmi. Adam is brought to life by the breath, the word, of a god transformed from inert matter into vibrant life, the first golem. And I should have said of God, not a god, of God, transformed from inner, inert matters into vibrant life, the first golem. The difference is that Adam became fully human while golems of legend never do. In golem stories, the monster is often disabled, speechless and sometimes, speechless and summon up some somnabolistic, a marionette acting on dreams and animal instinct. In Yiddish, one meeting of Goylem is Lummox. To quote the scholar Michael Chemers from God's perspective, all humans are disabled. The day I was born, I was a mass, a body of irregular borders. The shape of my body was pared away according to normal outlines, but this normalcy didn't last very long. My body insisted on aberrance. I was denied the autonomy that is the birthright of normality. Doctors foretold that I would be a vegetable, a thing without volition or self-awareness. Children like me were saved without purpose, at least not any purpose we could call our own. I am a golem. My body was built by human hands. And yet, if I once was Monier, I'm turning myself into Monstraire, one who unveils. Sorry. Um, welcome. Uh, it's such a pleasure to finally speak to you in depth about this book. Um, I emailed you when I was almost finished telling you how much I was just loving it. And I think anybody can relate to a lot of the things that are discussed in this book. I think more than anything, Golem Girl is a love story. It's a love story about family. It's your sheer will to continue and perseverance. It highlights your bravery, unbelievable bravery. Um, just 
about things that have taken place and uh, you're definitely a survivor. I mean, some, it, it's very moving to read this book. Um, I told you there were, there were sections in it. I wanted to scream. There were sections that made me angry and it's, I just loved it. So thank you. Um, why did you want to write the book? Um, I get asked that every time. I'm sorry. And I was trying to come up with something. No, it's it's okay. I um, you know, I've kind of run down the genesis of the book a lot, but I, I in this case, I think I want to say that um, why does anyone write a book? You you know, people have their individual um, reasons, but it really comes down to there's a way you want to engage with the world that uh, only a literary approach can do. As a, you know, I don't know if literary is something I've earned, but certainly uh, using one's alphabet. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's not like there was a divine inspiration or an angel flew in my window and said, thou shalt write. It was a long, slow evolution from writing lectures and public talks to wanting to find a different way to tell the stories than in the form of a lecture. Okay. Um, why don't you read the section that we talked about? Sure. And let people understand uh, well actually before you do that let when you were born <clears throat> mm -hmm. um you were it was immediately aware it became apparent you had spina bifida mm -hmm. and within i think a day of your birth you were transferred to the children's hospital no immediately immediately okay immediately they walked you across mm -hmm. um and uh, across the street where the children's hospital was. And thank God they had just hired a superstar surgeon who knew, uh, had been, had trained with the guy who had invented the surgery to help patients with spina bifida. It's a little tiny bit different. Um, he was very young. He, pediatric surgery as a field was very new. This was the late fifties and really pediatric surgery had only been a thing for less than a decade for sure. And when he was studying at Mass General in Boston, his name was Lester Martin. When he was uh, uh, finishing his residency at Mass General, he met someone who was a little bit older than him uh, named Hardy Hendren and Hardy Hendren had been one of the pioneers of pediatric surgery. And he cajoled, threatened, bullied Lester Martin into becoming a pediatric surgeon. So I think Dr. Martin had been there less than two years um, when, I, when I was born at Children's. So he had gone from Boston, Boston Children's to, he'd been hired at Cincinnati Children's. And so, the point I make in the book is that if I had been born a few miles farther away in a different city in Ohio, five years earlier, whatever, the story would be completely different. I probably wouldn't be here. Um, but what's interesting, as I came to find out as I was writing the book, is that um, of that generation of surgeons, uh, particularly ones who dealt with um, orthopedic issues and neurological issues and the kind of internal organ effect of neurological issues, um, they all knew each other. They all were like, they were this very small club of men. And, uh, and as I've been writing the book, I've been hearing bizarrely enough from some of my childhood surgeons or from people who were like their chief residents, because most of these guys are dead now. Um, and they've been telling me stories about how they all brought each other into the fold. And so um, the guy who 
brought Lester Martin into pediatric surgery exactly 40 years later, operated on me. Um, I'd never met him, but I went to Boston and he performed a surgery that saved my life. And it was just this total closing of the circle. So that shows you how much this was a, um, a generation of pioneers. So, uh, so that's a little background on what was going on. Um, but further than that, before I read this, what was truly bizarre uh, in the co coincidences around that period in 1958 is that my mother had been working for one of these guys, a, do a different doctor named Yosef Workany. And Yosef Workany had been uh, an Austrian Jew um, who had been a, a sort of this young gifted resident in Austria and had been given a, a fellowship to study in Cincinnati because Cincinnati was doing some very early work in genetics, children, genetics and birth defects. And so he comes to Cincinnati in the 50s or in the, I'm sorry, the early forties and Hitler invades and he can't go back. So now he's stuck in Cincinnati permanently because there's no way he can go back to Austria as a Jew. So this is who my mother ends up working for. And what's truly weird is that he ended up becoming the founding or one of, or the founding member of a field called teratology. And teratology is literally speaking the study of monsters, but it's the medical term for the study of birth anomalies. So my mom, was his uh, medical researcher um, just before I was born. She had, she had stopped working when she was pregnant with me. But uh, the upshot of that was that when I was born, um, she was one of the very, very rare mothers to know what it meant to have a kid with spina bifida. Because most of the time when a woman would have a kid like that or with any profound birth anomaly, the, a lot of the book, early book is about this. Um, the hospital and the social workers would bully the parents into institutionalizing their children. And one of my surmises in the book is that the reason I wasn't institutionalized is because mom was working with Yosef Workany and she was already inured to the sight of a lot of disabled children with every kind of anomaly you can think of. So, so you've, I think of it as this really like a spiral, you know, like this guy knows this one and then this one causes this in my life and the next one steps in, but he's there because somebody else brought him in and the whole thing starts with my mother working for working in. And, and so watching that unfold as I was writing was just fascinating because I didn't know a lot of this until I started writing the book. So it was very much an experience of, discovery and shock as I went along. Like I didn't decide to tell the story because I knew the story. I found out the story as I started to write. Fascinating. So that's kind and of an overfly. All, well, I mean, you, it brings up um, the fierce love and dedication that your mother had for you and how she fought for you. Um, for her entire life. She was a lioness and, uh, and the doctors respected her and knew, uh, knew that. Uh, but yes, she was familiar with a lot of the medical terms and she wasn't afraid, but you also point out in the book, she'd had two miscarriages and three, excuse me. Um, you know, they, your parents were desperate for a baby and she was going to keep you <laughs> and yeah. make sure that you got everything you need. And, you know, you, you bring up how Mary Shelley had had um, miscarriages and uh, of her five pregnancies, only one lived to adulthood. So uh, you understand how Frankenstein could come from someone who was desperate to uh, revive the living and, or revive the dead. And 
I, I just found that amazing, you know, just amazing connections. Thank you. Uh, I was shocked. I hadn't known that part. I went back and started reading about uh, Mary Shelley and because um, I was actually looking for some other information about Frankenstein. And I start to read this. And I'm like, oh, my God, she went through the same thing in certain ways that my mother did. And then I started thinking, you know, a child made of surgery and a child that can't die because it's already been dead and like all this stuff, like, oh my, my God, I've never read anybody. I'm sure that other people have written about this, but I've never in any of the times that I've studied Frankenstein in school um, had anyone give a perspective uh, I mean, I've heard them talk about, oh, Mary Shelley as a woman writer and how, uh, you know, her husband was credited with the book and all this stuff. And, but never from the perspective of a bereaved mother. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Um, you spent the first two years of your life in the hospital. Yes. And they were, I mean, it's not because it was like a daycare center that you were getting treatment for yeah. various things. And, but I mean, just <clears throat> thinking about that, um, how the medical procedures and things that you had to endure during those two years. And then thinking about the stress it must've been on your parents to, I mean, every day your mom would come to the hospital and, you know, by that time she knew everybody and she was very chatty and, and um, keeping a hawk's eye on what was happening to you. So you didn't, you didn't meet your younger, younger brother until you got home from the hospital that uh, after two years when your mom finally Rehearsed with you. Yes. Release me. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Um, but your, you know, the scenes from your childhood when you were out playing with your brothers and just uh, doing more was was great. So, why don't you talk about? Do you want to read the Shrek chapter? Sure. Let me set this up a little bit. Sure. Um, so the book is in two basic sections. And uh, section one is Golem and section two is Girl. And the first part is um, from my childhood until, uh, until I start college. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of drama in there. I won't go into right now. No spoiler, <laughs> no spoilers. Um, read the book. But, <laughs> yeah, read the book, there's a lot of drama. Um, but uh, I had been raised to believe that I would never have a relationship. Um, this is what the status was of disabled people of my time. And in many ways it persists. And um, uh, I mean, hey there. about the number of, of relationships you've ever seen on television that are between either two disabled people or, or a disabled person and a able-bodied person. I mean, I can think of one right now on TV on that show called Mom. There's probably another, but that's, in terms of broadcast TV, that's all I can think of. Um, but the idea being that this is rare, that people with disabilities don't have families, they don't have relationships. And when I grew up, it, it was just, flat out told me that I would never have a career. Uh, it wasn't mean. It wasn't like, nah, nah, nah. it was like, we're trying to protect you. So we want you to have realistic expectations. And these are your expectations. So um, when I went to college, uh, a lot of what I thought was going to happen turned out to be not. <laughs> so this is... Um, this is a chapter in a, in a better way. Yes, in a better way. Right, in, in a, a better, better way. way. Yes. And so this chapter, which is called Shrek, um, is about what was happening. I had met my first boyfriend and he was an absolute, he's a doll and 
physically very beautiful, very talented, funny guy. He's actually still, after all these years, um, one of my closest friends. And you can see his portrait on my uh, website um, under Will Fugo. But so let's see if I can. Okay. Yeah, the picture, the picture in the book of the two of you, you look adorable. And yeah, it's, the two I'll, of you I'll show together. you that. I will show you that. Um, so chapter and 30. Just one. I just wanted to add all the chapters are named after horror movies. Horror movies and books. Yes. Yes. And books. Um, so and uh, for those of you who don't know, Shrek in uh, German and Yiddish means uh, fear. Um, so uh, fear, fright, this kind of thing. Um, 1977. In my sophomore year, I fled the dorms in favor of a chavarat, Hebrew for friendship house, off campus, along with seven other Jews who wanted to observe Shabbos and the laws of Kashrut. We rehabbed a decrepit house on Emming Street and thereby inadvertently established a center for Jewish students from all over the, uh, but boy, I, my tongue is not in the room yet. Hold on one sec. Okay, let me try that again. <clears throat> we rehabbed a decrepit house on Emming Street and thereby inadvertently established a center for Jewish students from all over the university. Our holiday celebrations were massive events of communal cooking. I once spent three solid days making blintzes only to see them all eaten in the space of 45 minutes. My bedroom was the solarium. Three walls of windows that stayed freezing cold in winter, but bathed me in light all year round. Will and I lay entwined on my narrow bed and listened to Dylan albums, working backwards from desire to blonde on blonde. A perfect picture of college love, a picture that didn't register with the rest of humanity. Will and I went out on a date at a fancy for college students restaurant. Linen tablecloths, linen napkins, the whole shebang when a babe in a slinky gown shimmied up to our table and dropped a slip of paper by Will's highball glass. On it was inscribed a phone number, a name, and call me sometime. Another night, we were holding hands in a movie line when the girl, sorry, <clears throat> when the girl behind me said, no, she must be his sister. Look at her, look at him. We were starring in our own version of Beauty and the Beast, a fairy tale that tells us that it takes a selfless love to desire an ugly body. Male ugliness is not an obstacle. Talking frogs and werewolf noblemen suggest that no matter how repugnantly a man may behave, inside every brute is a prince. Yet there are markedly few stories in which a beastly woman is revealed as a great beauty. Even Shrek shows us Princess Fiona as a more or less Cameron Diaz long before we see the trollette. The female member of the couple must be beautiful, at least as attractive as the male or something has gone wrong in the social order. La Belle et la Bête lay under the movie Will and I saw on our first real date. That's the French term for the original fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast. Our first, real uh, our first real date, Annie Hall, another story in which an ugly guy deserved a pretty girl. In fairy tales, the reverse never holds true. Fairy tale ugliness is symbolic of evil or of moral ambiguity at the least, e.g. the beast's behavior pre and post bell. Female beauty symbolizes the purity and morality demanded by patriarchal social structure, there's too much to say about beauty here, but its relationship to power begs this question. Why would a man, a beautiful man, want to plant his seed in a monster? Will and I confuted the myth, so we were invisible as a couple, even to people who knew us well. That Thanksgiving, Will's sister Denise got married at a ritzy hotel in Cleveland. Will's uncle Mike sidled up with his own little slip of paper. Hey, Billy, here's a list of gals you should call while you're home. Get yourself some action, kid. Uncle Mike somehow failed to notice Billy's girlfriend standing three inches away. 
During the wedding dinner, Cleveland was hit by a blizzard. The entire party was snowed into the hotel, leaving Will and me all the time in the world to explore the arcana of cufflinks and cummerbunds and strapless bras. As we drifted off to sleep, he murmured in my ear, Chen, I dropped that list in the trash. Most of my own family treated Will with friendly bafflement, but Grandpa pulled me aside while I was downstairs shooting pool with my cousins. I know you like this boy, Riva, but if you really care for him, you should let him see other girls. Apparently, there had been a family conference. All these people who loved me believed that Will could not. I couldn't believe that my mother would never witness this unforeseeable love. She would have made it real. And here's the picture of Will and I in college. If I can get this without the book is stuck to a book rack. So that's the two of us in 1980, I think. So, um, so yeah, that's one of the adventures. The book kind of goes in and out of trying to put context to the things that happen. Um, this was very important to the writing of the book that, um, as I've said a number of times, it's not really important that it's my life. Um, I don't actually find my own life that interesting. What was interesting to me was were the um, societal forces and phenomena that I could look at through the lens of what had happened to me. I love um, the scene you set up when you first go to Condon School, how it was a combination like bedlam and anarchy and um, the place. Oh, it, I, one quick second, Wendy. Sure. Um, I'm getting a question about captioning. I, the closed, is, there, is, yes. the, is the captioning on? Yes, there is a closed, uh, we use a closed captioning service. And if people want to not look at it, uh, go to the closed captioning service, you know, the CC where it says live transcript, hit the carrot that will give you a um, drop down menu where you can hide the subtitles. Um, okay, sorry, I, I didn't. That's if okay. If there were people out there who wanted them, I wanted to make sure that it, um, Yes. Uh, and I'm, existed. I'm and sorry I, if it wasn't working. No, that's okay. And I'm also getting a lot of comments that I should speak less and let you speak more. So I'm, we're having a conversation. We, this is a conversation. We, yes. And people we've been talking, Reva and I've been talking for several weeks. So a lot of this, um, we've, we've talked about this. So um, I'm not, hogging the stage. Good, don't worry. I'm not throwing things at the screen. So okay. We're good. 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 We're good. So um, the the scene, Condon was a school for um, disabled, disabled children. children. Mm -hmm. And it was the first place where you saw other kids like yourself. And even though it was a school that people, you know, able-bodied kids teased, when they saw the Condon bus, when you were at Condon, you were, you felt safe because you were among your peers. And that first uh, mm -hmm. section where you, you're there with, I think your mother and your grandmother, and it, it was just so funny because um, it was, it looked like chaos, but it was a great kind of chaos. Um, do you want to talk about the school at all or sure um read that section just that opening it's sure um let me the reading glasses where have they gone wait a minute oh i was using the wrong ones this, i have way too many pairs of glasses i blame morby parker they have they've had a terrible effect on my life these are the reading glasses that are in good shape here we go all right. Uh, ah, my golem fell over. By the way, I have I have my golem always ready when I'm going to do a reading. 
This is a version of the golem from, there's a 19, 1915-ish silent film in Yiddish called Der Goylem um, that uh, you can still find. Um, it's not entire, I think it, it's basically a series of clips, but the costuming that they come up with for the golem uh, is just fantastic. A stone page boy, what's not like to li not to like. Um, do you happen to know our page number for that? Uh, I moseying around in here. Uh, it's the section right before Heidi. I think it's the yeah, the island of Dr. Moreau. Okay, let me find page thirty and thirty-one. Got it. All righty. Um, how much do you want me to read? Start with the room was swirling. This is at the bottom of page 30. Yes. Got so it. you've just, you think you're going to regular school and you had a I surprise. I thought I was at the hospital. Oh, I was okay. totally confused. I didn't, I was told that this was school, but it looked like the hospital to me. So I didn't know where the hell I was. Um, and we had been asked to bring like all my medications and there were women in white nurses uniforms and wheelchairs in the hallway. And I just thought it's the hospital. So, <clears throat> so, but we finally find our way down to the kindergarten annex. And this is where it picks up. The room was swirling with kids in wheelchairs and crutches, but unlike the ones in the hospital, these kids weren't sick. They were as energetic as any other bunch of junior demons. Boys and girls zipped all over the room in a wheelchair demolition demolition derby, while others crutched at remarkable speed, considering the wingspan of five-year-old arms. It was a giant pinball game as played by rhesus monkeys. Mom led me over to the lady waving her arms in the middle of the floor. Reva, say hello to your teacher, Miss Woodbridge. And just parenthetically, I heard from Kathy Woodbridge. This is, there's so much more to say here. Yeah. Fifth. 50 Her years later, daughter. I hear from my kindergarten teacher. Honest to God. Miss Woodbridge was Peter Pan's sister, delicate and fay, with this most singularly upturned nose I'd ever seen. I privately dubbed her Miss Nosebridge. I let the grown-ups talk while I spun around, trying to look everywhere at once. Two pairs of blue eyes were regarding me with equal curiosity. The first pair belonged to a round-faced boy. He was my first crush whose thatch of coppery hair sprouted above a galaxy of freckles. His crutches splayed sideways like the legs of a day old fawn. But it was the second pair of eyes that really demanded my attention. Those big blue eyes were very big, magnified behind lenses thick as family Bibles. The girl had hair the color of dry autumn leaves with poofy banks that spoke of first day tussles with the curling iron. We've all been there. Tall and skinny and pressed up against the fireplace, she jerked her head in my direction. Get over here, you dingbat, before they mow you down. I glanced back. Mom and Grandma were waving goodbye. I shrugged and launched myself into anarchy. So Condon School had been uh, established in... 1919, while I was writing the book, I did a lot of research on Condon. And the story was fascinating because when I was growing up, Cincinnati was ridiculously conservative. It's only gotten worse. As they say, Cincinnati was a good place to be from. <laughs> um, you know, anyway, uh, so it never dawned on me that Cincinnati could be anything else. But as I started to research this school, the story with a lot of these early special schools is that um, around the turn of the century, there were quite a number of medical breakthroughs. Um, it was a little too early for antibiotics, kind of, but uh, 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 sterilization techniques, cleanliness routines, um, a lot of things that had been learned on the battlefield during uh, the Civil War and then World War I really changed uh, medicine before even antibiotics started having their effect. And so all these kids started to live through. So you know how people used to have families of like 
9, 10, 12 kids. It was because, like Mary Shelley, it was quite possible most of those kids weren't going to grow up because they were just killed by everything. But now that started to change. So you had all these kids in hospitals, and there were only grown-up hospitals. There were no children's hospitals that I know of um, that weren't dying. And so everybody, the grown-ups kind of looked around and went, now what? Maybe they should go to school. So the hospitals had classrooms in the, you know, in annexes in the basement. And then in Cincinnati, the hospital school at Children's at um, General, old Cincinnati General got so big that a lot of women who were the parents of these kids decided to start um, raising money. Uh, and I mean, we're talking in some ways like bakery sales and penny uh, campaigns and stuff to build a school. And as they're doing this, they're talking about accessibility. And this is like 19, like I said, it opened in 1919. So this is starting around 1900. And they're talking about accessibility. And they're working with an architect to make what was at the time the most accessible building almost in the country. If you saw Condon now, or Condon is gone, but if you had seen what it was now, you'd been like, what? That's not, that is not an accessible building. But at the time it was absolutely radical. So the same way they started to look for early ideas of um, disability education. So this school opens and it's like internationally famous. The circumstances changed a lot, it became very complicated, but Apparently this was part of this very progressive movement in Cincinnati and partly because Cincinnati had been a major stop on the Underground Railroad. It's the first city north of the Mason-Dixon line. And so there were all of these abolitionists and progressives, what we would think of as progressives in the city. And so the early story of disability education in Cincinnati is really tied with ideas of social justice. And I, you know, we were never told any of that. I had no idea, but I read something like 500 articles from the local papers and magazines. And I put it together about what was going on there because no one's ever written about Condon. So that's some background about what was going on there. I mean, I'm just struck by the, the luck that you well, there's bad luck and there's good, good luck, but the luck that you had access to that surgeon right after you were born, the luck that there would be a school like that in Cincinnati where you happen to live. Um, those are, I, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, speaking of luck, what about the chapter on bad luck or Good luck. We talked about that. Um, hang on. I think there's just sort of one paragraph that explains what yeah. I mean. It's it's one one page or one paragraph, but it's a good one. Um, I think I should just bring for a corneal transplant. Pardon me. Uh, uh, what, what page, please? I'm looking. Um, I mean, the original title of the book was Golem Girl Gets Lucky. And my editor and I had a number of giant smackdown arguments about that. And I, okay, fine, Golem Girl. But that was, that was the original title. It was on that list I sent you earlier. I'm just looking now. Uh, I mean, I know that Chicago, I don't know if anybody out there um, knows anything about the history of the um, School for Disabled Children here in Chicago. I am blanking on the name. Um, it began with an S. Uh, Sandy Yee, you might know. Um, but it was way more, so this is the other thing about, well, while Wendy's looking, this is the other thing about those schools is that almost all of them were uh, 
uh, residential, um, almost all schools for disabled children up until about five minutes ago, <laughs> um, were, they were just vocational training residential institutions where you really didn't get much of an education and you were probably trained, you were given just enough numeracy and literacy to go and work in a warehouse, something like that, or you know, in an assembly, um, uh, on an assembly line, but not much else. Um, Condon, again, was highly unusual in that it was a day school. And the philosophy, the thing that was radical about it is that they were giving us standard education. I mean, they were trying to make it be tailored to kids with particular educational parameters, but, um, but we didn't stay overnight and they weren't teaching us to pack boxes. And at the time, I think there was only one other school in the entire country. And that happened to also be in Ohio. Uh, it was called the Sunshine School. But I'd love it during the Q&A if anybody knows uh, or ever went to the school that was here in Chicago. So Wendy, did you find it? Yes, um, page 21, Leprechaun. Oh, right. OK. Um, well, you already talked a little bit about, uh, I'll just do the first two, um, the first couple of chapters. I mean, yeah. Uh, so chapter five, Leprechaun. I hope this isn't too much for people. Um, no, they want, they want to hear you. They don't want to hear me. <laughs> Who knows why? You get what you ask for, people. Um, there's not just love in this story, but luck. There's both bright luck and dark luck. Bright luck was two parents who loved me. Bright luck was Dr. Martin as my surgeon and a mother who'd had a hospital career. Dark luck is not bad luck. Luck can be shrouded and... My mute button is not working. Let's try and... I've... There's nothing more entertaining than having a chronic cough in the middle of a pandemic. You don't want to scare somebody, just go up behind them at the grocery store. <laughs> like and standing, standing high jump. We've also um, gotten the school that you were looking for, Spalding. Spalding, thank you. Thank you. Uh, dark luck is not bad luck. Luck can be shrouded and half shadowed. If its outcome takes years, half a lifetime, to be revealed. If its origin is pain. My darkest luck was a gift from my three dead siblings. Carol had three miscarriages in the three years between her wedding day and the day I was born. After such loss, how could she give up a living child? And then it goes on to talk about Frankenstein. Um, Wendy? The ball's in your court. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the fierce love that your uh, your mother, I mean, your parents loved you equally, but your father was at work all day and your mother was the one who knew all the, um, she knew all the background and the details concerning the medical procedures that you've had in your care. And uh, so there's, there's the fierce love that your mother has for you. And you also talk a lot about your grandmother. And um, when I spoke to you earlier, you said that there were um, parts of the book that had to be edited out uh, prior to publication that would give more dimension to your grandmother. Um, and I bring that up because there are sections where she's just mean to your mother. And it's heartbreaking to hear. And uh, I, so what, can you talk about your grandmother? Do you want to um, flesh her out a little bit more? Yeah. Huh, Grandma Fanny. Um, she was really interesting. She was considered to be a great beauty when she was young. 
I think a lot of that was style. I mean, I've seen pictures of her. She was a pretty woman, but she wasn't, you know, uh, oh my God, the woman who was in uh, Casablanca. Anyway, I'm getting old. I'm losing, losing names. Ingrid, Ingrid, Ingrid Bergen. Bergen. Yeah. Um, by the way, I just totally parenthetically, I once heard her daughter talk about uh, Ingrid Bergman and um, how beautiful she was and that people would come up and tell her all the time what a beauty she was. And she found this way to respond that she would just say, thank you, isn't it lucky? And I thought that was the most graceful response you could possibly make. And he talked about luck. Anyway, um, so, uh, so like I said, a lot of grandma's sort of glamour was style. She had just beautiful taste in clothing. She and her mother had both been um, seamstresses. And there's a, there's a rumor in the family that my great grandmother tailored for the Romanoffs. I can't see how that's possible, but family legend, what can you do? Um, but uh, I have over, I'm not gonna show you my messy living room. This is as much of my living room as you got to see. But over in that corner is a cedar chest that's full of grandma's clothing, including this beautiful little lace cocktail dress she made herself and a, and a really heavy silk kimono and, and just beautiful stuff. Do you fit into but them? No, no. Grandma was tall and thin. So, nope. Um, anyway, I wish. Uh, I've thought about having them framed. I don't have enough wall space. Uh, but anyway, Grandma, she was an only child. She was very, I think, pampered in up to a point. I mean, these were her parents were desperately poor uh, Russian immigrants um, who had, my grand, great-grandfather had no English. My great-grandmother had a little bit. Um, my great-grandfather was a stevedore down by the river. Um, he apparently was unbelievably strong. And when you see him, he looks like a frowning refrigerator in pictures. <laughs> but, uh, but I think grandma Fanny was used to getting her own way, but I think she also was one of those immigrant kids who sort of became in charge of her parents' lives because she was the intercessor, the one who could speak the language. And as I say in the book, she was determined immediately to be modern, modern, modern. And so I have pictures of her in flapper gowns and stuff. And, um, and when she, but at the same time, I think a lot about Jewish anxiety and how fleeing from pogroms and then living through, like she and her husband survived the war. My, my parents, my mother's family survived the war, uh, the depression rather, um, by having a black market that they ran out of their drugstore, which struggled for, for years and years and years and before it finally became successful. And I think that there's a way that Jewish anxiety either expresses itself in hopelessness, a sort of depressed hopelessness, or a really intense desire to control everything. That if you don't control everything, it's all gonna fall apart and it's all gonna be disaster. And it's the same, it's the same feeling, but it's just depends on what you think you can do about it. So grandma uh, controlled everyone in the family. Um, my grandparents, after moving drugstores like five times or something, they got a spot. If you know Cincinnati, they got a spot right on Finley Market, which at the time was the center of downtown Cincinnati. So people would come down. It's a big open air market. Um, there's one like that in Cleveland and Philadelphia. Um, there might have used to be one here. Sort of remember hearing something. Um, but so you have to imagine everybody would come downtown to get their meats and cheeses and vegetables. And there's my parents, my grandparents' drugstore right on the corner. So they became pretty well off. And grandma partly used that money to both take care of her family and control the hell out of it. I used to think it was just us, but in researching my family, I found out that my grandmother, oh, 
her her poor daughters in law, like <laughs> my uncle's wives, which is <laughs> my uncles would give in to my grandma asking for keys to everybody's house. And grandma would just go in and do what she wanted. And in our house, that meant like when I would come home from school, she would have decided what clothing and toys and stuff I no longer needed. And I'd come home and there'd just be all these, you know, same with my brothers. My brother and I were talking about the other day. He's like, do you know how much that baseball card collection would be worth by now? And I'm like, talk to me about my Barbies. <laughs> but that's sort of the funnier part of it. Grandma um, had this fat phobia for unknown reasons. Don't know what that was about. But my mother was a big woman. She took after her father, not her mother. And my grandmother was extremely abusive to her about her weight. And but, that just, yes. But just, I mean, your mother was beautiful. She was and- beautiful bubbly and she Brilliant. had a great sense of style and she could sew and she you know she wanted to go to um fashion school fashion school and your parents forced her to work in the pharmacy um Her parents yeah yeah or yeah sorry um ugh, that was yeah, I, she, I, her life was not mom had a heart your mom had a hard life. She did. Um, when so, I don't know what you want to do about Q and A, I forget what our timing is. Uh, we make sure we have time for people to. Uh, we can to start. Us. We can start that now. Um, no, I, I don't want to interrupt your questions. I just no, I'm not I, tracking. Um, you you were in charge, Wendy Cromash. <laughs> not, 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 not really. Um, yeah, uh, Aunt Fan or Grandma Fanny was a tough cookie, and um, the the part where she would just yell at your grand your mom and tell her how fat she was and leave. Um, your housekeeper was a tremendous source of stability and affection, and she helped your mom. Tre- a lot um and i i i've heard you say or or read that you really couldn't find out any information about her family um did were you able to reach any of her children or no that's a complicated situation um at this point i wouldn't even know how i know that her daughter got married i don't know what her married name would be um i haven't been in touch with her family since oh god maybe what uh 1988 something like that um she was she was a very loving force in your household and helped your mom a lot when your mom would just get these um would be just depressed and in take to her bed after one of grandma Fanny's outbursts. Um, So one of the reasons I wrote about Dory who Dora holiday, who was our housekeeper is that uh, Dora was black and I wanted to write about gently, but without flinching um, about the history of uh, black household help in Jewish families that, you know, at the time that I was a kid, most of the women, uh, middle-class women that I knew who were Jewish had some kind of household help if they could. And these were almost universally black women. Our family was a little bit different in that our family was in such horrible shape that Dory often would stay with us for days, even though she had her own family. And I wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, my mother and Dory would call each other their best friends, but I wanted to recognize that that is an incredibly fraught thing to say that I couldn't, I couldn't just say, oh, they were best friends. Like that is a relationship that is so defined by economics and racial inequality and social, socioeconomic inequality. 
and the history of, I mean, like I said, we're right on the Mason Dixon line. So, you know, I've often said that Cincinnati is a Southern city that thinks it's a Northern city. Um, and that all I could say is this is what I witnessed. This is what I heard, what the truth is, I'll never know. And I needed to talk about the fact that everything I'm talking about in as far as their relationship goes is from the standpoint of a small child who had no idea about any of these forces. And that I know that this is a difficult and painful thing for our country to grapple with. So, you know, I don't wanna just skip over, like, yes, yeah, Dory was, our family would have just absolutely disintegrated without her. But I also know that her family suffered for it. I mean, she, she was able to economically support them when her husband wasn't working. So there's that, but she was absent a tremendous amount because she was with us. And that I know that that is a pretty serious price to pay. Well said. Um, okay. Why don't we close? Would you mind reading the page on 345 that talks about your, um, your work with the medical students, which sure. I found fascinating? Hopefully I will be going back in the fall. Um, where are we? And we didn't even, unless you want to continue, we could, um, all right, let's do this and then, because I want you to have an opportunity to talk about your portraiture. Would you mind if we do that instead? Sure. Okay. Um, You're the boss. <laughs> uh, for people who don't know, this book is structured around my real career, which is I'm a portrait artist. And um, when I wrote the book, I was acutely aware of having absolutely no chops. Um, I've had almost no training as a writer uh, and I've had a lot of training as a painter. And um, there were moments all, the, all that my brain was saying is, what in the hell do you think you're doing? Um, you don't know how to do this. I wouldn't, uh, anyway, um, but so, what the major theme that runs through the book is staring is that um, because you guys can't tell, I was just talking to a colleague the other day uh, in disability studies about Zoom and how when you are disabled, Zoom puts you in this bizarre place that like right now you guys can't tell anything. Um, if I got up and walked around, you'd be able to tell that I'm short, that I limp, that I have a curved spine, I'm not gonna do that. But there's a normalizing effect in Zoom. And so you end up being trapped between either feeling like you're hiding or trying to pass or being forced to what we call perform our disabilities in order to be seen as a whole body. Um, and for me, it's particularly acute because the way I look and the way I move has gotten me bullied my entire life from day one. And in fact, uh, about four days ago, I was, Wendy was talking about how enraging she found some of the stories in the book of how I'm treated. So four days ago, um, I'm doing my daily walk. I try and do about two miles a day and I was heading to the, to the lake and I was on headphones with my, my studio assistant and we were talking about something professional. And this woman stepped into my path and said, I wanna to talk to you. And I'm talking to my assistant and I'm like, hold on a second. I just kind of pushed my headphones aside but they could still hear me what was going on. And this woman said, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you and that Jesus is praying to make it so that you walk better. And I just kind of blinked and thought, oh God, another one of these. And I went to step, I just said, okay. And I went to step around her. And again, she like jumps in my path, once let, lets me um, pass and says, Jesus really loves you and he wants you to get better. And I just mumbled something and ran. And I, you know, I, when I got off, I had said to my assistant, you know, I've been told so many times that Jesus loves me that I, I sort of feel like, you know, like I'm his crush object or something. 
Um, but the point of all that is that I get stared at, I get bullied. Most of the people I know who are visibly disabled get stared at, get bullied, get told horrendously awful things, including <clears throat> being told that we should kill ourselves or that the person talking to us would kill themselves if they looked like us, which is really just, just really improves your day. So I got really obsessed as a kid with um, what it meant to be looked at. And that led me into a whole career of um, portraiture. Um, when I went to art school, I realized that portraiture was, was my fascination and that what I wanted to do, it took years to figure this out, but what I wanted to do was to work with people who underwent stigma. And that wasn't just people with disabilities, it was people who uh, are queer or trans or people of color, anybody who would say to me that they had been made to feel like I'm not ever going to go up to somebody and say, I bet you're bullied, you know, but if somebody comes to me and says, I know your work and I know you work with people who have been made to feel like their bodies are unacceptable either from the way they look or the way that they're performed, um, you know, we'll start talking and that's one of the ways I end up doing a portrait. And when I'm doing portraits, what I'm doing is uh, long interviews where I ask the person I'm working with a lot about their life, mainly about their work, about how their life of the body affects their work. And then the portraiture approach is extremely collaborative. Um, a lot of different projects to explore the ethics of the artist patient, uh, patient the artist subject relationship. Then I'll show you where my brain goes. Um, so the whole book is completely full of uh, portraits of, it's structured around the story of, these are some people, you know, some of you guys might know Mike Irvin or have known his, his first wife, Anna Stoneham. Um, let's see. Uh, Techie Lemnicki, I'm looking for people here in Chicago that you might be familiar with. There's Techie. These are terrible. I mean, just look at my website, but there are dozens and dozens of portraits. Here's my, my brother and his, his son who's also disabled. Or I just lost that. Where'd it go? Oh, here's Doug and Nathan. So my nephew has a developmental disability. Um, but there are literally dozens. And the whole back of the book is a book inside a book um, called The Portraits, where I tell individual stories um, about each person I've worked with. Or sometimes they, they tell their own story. I invited people to write themselves what it was like to work with me or uh, sometimes we documented our conversations uh, in, in progress. So the book, is, the book is thick because it's an art book and a, um, and a memoir and a history and a toothbrush and a mattress and a coffee table and a really big brooch. Anyway, so shall we think, talk to people? Yes, I think that's a good place to stop, to stop and answer some questions. Uh, let's see. And for people who are wondering, yes, we're recording this and it will be posted on YouTube. Okay, let me get to the questions. Um, Maureen would like to know, are you familiar with the documentary Crip Camp? It's uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Um, Jim's a friend of mine, and and I know uh, Judy Human a little bit. I enjoyed that movie. It's fabulous. It's up for um, an Oscar. Oh, great! How would your life have been different with a different mother? How would your <laughs> life be different with a different mother? Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't know. Is there um, a clairvoyant out there that we can ask? How, um, 
uh, how have your brothers reacted? Um, I'm sure you you shared parts, you know, you spoke to them about memories and just getting things straight, but can you talk about how your family's reacted to the book? Um, I have two you... brothers, one I'm very close to, one I am not. Um, the one I'm close to read the book, he found it painful, but he stuck with it with me. And um, it became something that we, we used as a springboard for a lot of memories. Um, I was interviewing him the whole entire time, just checking memories. Um, the other brother, I don't want to talk about very much. He is Orthodox. He is not happy about the book. I don't talk to him about it. I try okay. and pretend it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, did your older brother, the o older of the two brothers, you're the oldest of the siblings. Um, the Did your brother who liked the book and found it painful. Was it painful because he wasn't aware of how much you were bullied and the things that happened to you? No. No, he things. was he was there during, I mean, it's because a lot of really painful stuff happened in our family. Yes. And this brought it back. Yes. Um, uh, can you talk about the special services uh, provided by Condon? Um social services well um it's a lot uh we had it was very therapy oriented um we had physical therapy occupational therapy psychological psychotherapy audiology speech therapy god i vocational therapy i mean as i say in the book if it, <laughs> it adds the word therapy in it we had it um, uh, so that was a little intense, um, and constant and every day. So you'd sort of alternate your classes with therapy. Um, there was a doctor's suite, a nurse's suite, a dentist. Um, there was a whole big chunk of the second floor was, were, uh, was the medical suite. Um, so you know, a lot of kids would need sort of various kinds of medicines or interventions during the day. So sometimes you had a regular standing appointment with the nurse. Other times, if you were having a health problem, the, the, there were like five different beds. Uh, so it was quite large. Um, as I also describe, uh, it was a place where we were studied. So it wasn't just services, we were a captive population. So um, doctors, residents, medical researchers, a lot of medical researchers came through and interviewed us, measured us, you know, worked with our doctors on studies. I'm in a bunch of longitudinal studies. I don't know whatever happened to them. Um, the rooms were, um, each room had a bathroom um, every single room had a bathroom. There were aides. Uh, uh, we called them aides. I, I guess now they'd PAs. I'm not sure what they'd be called now, but teaching assistants. But they were there to help kids with whatever they needed physically from, you know, writing things down, getting their books, um, uh, helping take notes, taking them to the bathroom, taking them. I mean, whatever kids needed. Um, I wasn't one of the kids that had a PA, but there would usually be at least four or five in the room. Um, Were there any blind children there? There, yes, uh, I can think of two. Um, with the blind kids and the deaf kids, I'm not sure how they ended up at Condon because there was a school for the blind and a school for the deaf. So somehow they ended up with us and I, don't know if they were very well served. I know the blind girl that I went to school with had a braille and a braille typewriter and someone who read with her and took notes and stuff. But I don't know if she was as, um, now I think she might have had progeria. So in her case, I wonder a little bit if she was there because progeria was more intense than, um, than her blindness. I'm not that's, sure that's what she had, but I think so. That's the aging um, disease. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, she looked like a little old lady. Um, the boy who was deaf was a real poser. Um, he may have had something else that I'm unaware of. We didn't, it's not like we walked around with, hello, my name is George. I have, you know, epilepsy. <laughs> Felt like we did, but we didn't actually. Um, and then one of the other things is that the school buses were the first in the country to have ramps. So they had these big steel ramps that pulled out from under the floor. So the bus drivers would, um, you know, when we came and go, came and went, if you were a wheelchair user, there were these, the front of the bus was empty and it had these bolts. And so you, they would back up the wheelchair into these clamps and then slide the bolts. And then, uh, and that's how you'd get, you know, kids who needed ramping had ramped buses. So there were a whole lot of other things, but you sort of get the picture. Sure. Uh, do you have any involvement currently with guiding um, or with children who have disabilities? No. Okay. Uh, what does Reva do at the Art Institute? Um, well, right now I'm teaching graduate studies in the painting department. I'm graduate advisor. Um, I've taught a lot of different things, uh, mainly figure drawing and anatomy, but other things as well. But right now I'm, I'm just part of the graduate faculty. Okay. Can you talk about uh, the role you have at the medical school? Uh, so like I said, I'm on break there right now because of COVID. I can't go into the cadaver lab easily because the class that I teach, I have to be right next to my students. I can't do it from six feet away. Um, but I teach class uh, called Drawing in a Jar where we work with what's called the Airy Krantz collection of um, fetal uh, specimens. And so there's a, a long case in the cadaver lab um, that has uh, fetuses that have both quote unquote normal development on one side to show the stages of, um, you know, over a more than nine month period, I think. But the rest of the cases are things that happen during development. So including spina bifida um, and encephaly where one is born with, without a brain or with only a partial brain. Um, gastroschisis, where the internal organs are not contained within the abdomen. Um, uh, Seronomelia, where the legs are fused together. So it's a whole lot of different, a lot of times these have to do with failures of fusion. So like um, a cleft palate. The, so when, the, when, the, when a fetus of any vertebrate kind is developing, there's sort of these series of tubes um, that have to fuse together in order to um, have a, a normative functional presentation. I, the words are so awful for this. Anyway, so there are at least um, 25, I think. And uh, what I teach is um, a portraiture class. So my students pick a vitrine um, with one of the fetuses. They have to do medical research on what, what it means, you know, what is what they're seeing. But I have them draw their, we don't use the word fetus. Actually, we use the word entity in class. And some of my students have started using the word companion because what I, the point of most medical specimens in museums is that either they reflect something that is thought to never exist, that it's been cured out of existence, or medicine plans to cure it out of existence. And the specimens are there as signposts. This is what it looks like, and this is what you're trying to eradicate. And it drives me up a wall. So what I try and teach is that these are bodies, basically are friends of mine. Like I know people with at least two thirds of the variations in the jars. And so they draw them very lovingly and very slowly. They have to do medical research, but at the end they have to do a 20 minute presentation on someone who's lived within the last 25 years that has that particular variation. 
and it only five minutes of it can be medical. Um, most of it has to be, so they have to find someone, there's been like a documentary or there's, they've gone on to be a professional person or there's a book about them or buy them or you know, they have a public life. So um, I want them to think about these entities as people who exist now, who have bodies now and who have invented lives for themselves that are not mistakes. And most of the time afterwards, when I debrief them about what they thought about the entities before we started class, because these are M1s and M2s, first and second year med students. And a lot of them are not really in yard yet, even though we're in cadaver lab. And, you know, I'm very, I love cadaver lab. Um, I'm actually writing about it now for a different, a different book. Um, they're not very hardened yet. So they want to look like they're clinically detached and they don't quite manage it. But so I can see that a lot of them are appalled by the, you know, these, these potential humans. And by the end of class, most of them have told me that they've really changed their minds. They wouldn't talk to a patient or a parent um, or, you know, do genetic counseling in anything like the same way that they would have at the beginning. So that's what I do. My dog was barking, so I had it on mute. Um, can you discuss the mirror exercise that you did where you had them draw there was something that they had to draw, that all of them draw, but each of them drew their own body incidences or traits into the... Uh, you're talking about the skeleton exercise. Okay, sorry. No, it's, about... it's okay. Don't, don't apologize. I was just trying to figure out what, which it's a, a long ass book and I forget what's in there. So um, no criticism. So here, I will show you a little corner of my messy apartment. I if you can see this. Uh, probably not. Way off in the corner there is a skeleton. If you guys can the see. Lamp is in, the okay. lamp is in the way. Uh, well, okay. okay. So you saw the mess. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I teach anatomy. And the first lesson in my anatomy course, and I actually do this for both anatomy and my figure drawing course, where I bring out one of our skeletons. And the one I bring out at class is exactly like the one I have over there, which is plastic. And so the plastic skeletons you get from the anatomical supply places are extremely normative. They've really like got no variations. No, they're as standard as you can get. And uh, his, his official name is Bucky the Budget Skeleton, which tells you a lot. Um, so I just put, I mean, I've renamed him Norbert. Uh, I put Norbert in the middle of class and I ask my students just to draw him with, with no, no instruction at all. Um, so this is first class. Partly I'm gonna see where they are in their development, but there's another reason. So I give him like half an hour to draw the skeleton. And then at the end, um, we go around and I show them that each one of them, most of them, have managed to draw their own bodies. So, which is why I use Norbert because he's so standard that, you know, the, the tall people have elongated him and the shorter people have shortened him and the, like, whatever is unusual about this person or, you know, uh, somewhere else on the bell curve, um, I see in the drawing. And my point is that we use our own bodies as the template on the world. We are our own measuring sticks and that we're just wandering around all the time, projecting ourselves onto the world, onto other people. And, you know, like to me, everyone is tall. Everyone is tall. This is the whole world is tall. People laugh at me. Um, and uh, they're all sort of poleaxed, you know, by, like I did what? And the weirdest one I talk about in the book is I had a student 
who's, this is the occipital bone here. She had a very elongated, sort of very long skull with a long occipital bone. And she drew the skeleton exactly like that with this very long uh, um, elongated skull. And when I said to her, oh my gosh, you gave you know, the skeleton your skull, she had no idea what I was talking about. She was not consciously aware at all that there was anything different about her own skull, but she still drew it. Like subconsciously, she still knew about the back of her own head and drew like, you know, that just, that just told me everything. I, and I think that's why I remembered it as the mirror exercise because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just found it so interesting that people do that. Uh, Kay would like to know about your hair. I have it. What about it? Um, the the uh, reddish purplish tint uh, was added externally. Uh, it's not your own color. <laughs> no, I, I sometimes I tell kids that I eat a lot of tomato soup. Um, but no, I do it myself. Right now it's not quite right because I got the hair cut. And normally there are stripes that come down. But um, I'm not afraid of, I mean, my hair is completely white. It's There's a little bit of dark in the back, but mostly I started going gray very early. Um, for me, it's more about... Uh, if you, you know, those of you that know me out there, um, I tend to manage how people treat me through style and fashion, much the way my mother did. And that at one point when my hair was going gray, it was turning into this kind of mouse colored mystery because it used to be almost black. It was sort of this red black color. And all of a sudden it just wasn't. And it was more that it was just kind of mediocre. And I thought, no, I, mm. there's just a long conversation there anyway. Okay. So I do it myself. I like it. Thank you. Um, Lori says, I read an article that mentioned you leave the art space when painting portraits and allow the subjects to tinker with your work? Uh, yes, um, it's, it's a particular project. It's not always. Um, what happens is that, uh, um, like I said, I'm interested in the ethics of the um, relationship. It, there's a long complicated history of the relationship between artist and portrait subject. And I wanted to complicate it and try and um, uh, equalize it. So because I know that it's difficult to be looked at and that it's difficult to let someone else depict what you look like, you know, I mean, it's not just being looked like, it's looked at, it's someone trusting me to produce an image that they're gonna be okay with. Um, and anyone who's ever had their picture taken knows that that's hard enough. So what I decided to do was this project called the Risk Pictures, um, where uh, people commit to a series of, um, of uh, three hour long sittings, generally at least five sittings. And so each one is three hours. And when two hours is up, I leave the house and I give them my entire house. I just trust them with everything in my house. I don't put any restrictions on what they can do, but in exchange for total freedom to like poke around or eat stuff or take naps or go on my computer or whatever they wanna do, which I'll never ask them about, that's part of the commitment. Um, uh, they have to work on their own portrait. So it's about taking responsibility for their own uh, representation, but it's also that I'm taking a huge risk by not knowing what I'm going to come back to. It's totally possible that they will have ruined the piece um, or done something that's so sideways to anything I intended that um, I'll just be stopped in my tracks. So we do that generally five times until um, the work is completed. Have you ever had a, pa a painting that was ruined? Not yet. I live in hope. 
Um, one of the questions uh, asked your opinion about mainstreaming versus special ed. Oh God. <laughs> I can answer this and maybe one more, but my voice is starting to go. Okay. So. Um, Absolutely. Uh, okay. I don't think there's any way back from mainstreaming. I think we're stuck with it. Um, I understand the reason for it. I'm sure it produces many good outcomes. However, from what I can see, generally what happens is that there will only be maybe a couple kids in a class who are, who are disabled, maybe a handful in a school, um, at least identifiably. I mean, there'll be kids who have non-visible impairments that their peers may or may not know about. Um, you know, something like ADHD is going to be so common that it's not going to really be read as, I, I doubt that it's going to be read as particularly remarkable. Um, but if a kid is visibly impaired or really remarkable, you know, markedly, not remarkably, but remar markedly behaviorally or psychiatrically impaired so that it gets noticed. Um, there aren't enough kids from what I've been able to tell in any particular class or school to understand themselves as uh, an identity, as a group. Um, they're, the pressure is to normalize, to be just like everybody else. I mean, I've heard this over and over that kids want to, all kids just about want to be like everybody. And um, so sometimes they pull that off. And, but what often seems to happen is that as you hit adolescence and puberty, that um, sexual standards start going. So even if you've had a lot of friends as a kid up until fifth grade or something, um, once that starts to hit and people start pairing off into crushes and dating and, you know, that those kids all of a sudden sometimes find themselves completely on the outs, that they're not going to be the one who gets picked. I could be wrong. This is what, this isn't my making it up. This is, these are the stories I hear. So my feeling is that if we're stuck with mainstreaming, I mean, if there were habitually always schools where you was dominated by one race and you had two kids who weren't in that racial group in the class and 10 in the entire school, it would be recognized as an issue, right? or kids who are non-English speakers or something, it would be recognized as a cultural issue. Um, it's not recognized in disability that there's anything about identity or cultural representation that would inform their experience. So what I'd like to see are two things. One is a curriculum in all schools that would both introduce themselves to the history of disability rights, which is very cool, and really dramatic and amazing. I mean, you can see from Crip Camp, start by showing them Crip Camp. Um, but also there's so much art now and there's so writing and performance and dance and fashion. And I mean, every form of art now has some really incredible practitioners. There are plenty of people to learn about. Have a curriculum where you get an introduction to disability culture and then have a place like some kind of, this city needs a cultural center. This city needs a disability cultural center badly. And, you know, if we had one where we could bring kids in and let them meet, I mean, Access Living was doing some of that for a while with the empowered Fifi's and the dudes and with the, um, uh, the arts and culture program, which wasn't necessarily aimed towards kids. I think kids desperately need a place that is fun and cool and not therapeutic and not, I mean, think of it this way. When a able-bodied kid takes art class 
It's so that they'll go be an artist. When a disabled kid takes art class, it's often so that, you know, it's therapeutic. It'll be good for them. It'll help them develop skills. And this is insupportable. So that and, is and my rant. A, and a well-deserved one to be said, um, but Condon was the first, was the school that tried to encourage intellectual ability and um, expand potential, not- Yes, not... no, I mean, it, read the book, um, everybody out there, it, it's incredibly complicated what happened at Condon. They did and they didn't. Um, I think we can do better. Sure. I think the disabled kids are being badly served. Okay. I don't know if there are people out there who would really disagree with me. I mean, I'd be open to comments if you feel that I'm wrong. Okay. I, I'm certainly things have improved since uh, you were in elementary school, one would hope. Um, but okay. Uh, can you tell us, uh, last question, what you're working on now, aside from massive publicity, talking to people like me? Three things. Um, I am about to do a very large, probably years long portrait of Rosemary Garland Thompson, who is um, one of the top scholars in disability studies and bioethics. So Rosemary posed for me uh, uh, remotely, I hired a photographer to take pictures of her in San Francisco. So I'm about to do a painting of Rosemary. Um, I'm finishing a large Zoom portrait of Sharona Pearl, who is uh, an academic out of, she's a professor at Drexel, outside Philly or in Philly, near Philly, um, who writes about physiognomy the face, the meaning of the face and the history of face transplants. So we've been working on a Zoom portrait for about three months now, and I'm almost done there. And then I'm starting a new book. So I'm can busy. You, can you tell us what the topic is? Or? Just it's fiction. It's dealing with some of the themes in Golem Girl, but from a different, a different perspective. Okay. Well, when you're finished the, that book, <laughs> come back. Come back and talk to us. Yeah, I hope I get to finish this book. It's this last few months has been not not a good period for getting work done. But you know, supporting have the you, book. Have you gotten vaccinated yet? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. I'm Mazel tov. <laughs> thank you. Is but I'm also I I worked with um Access Living and WB and B C to get them to do a program about vaccine equity and disabled people because disabled people have been just about roundly ignored in the tier um, structure in almost every state. And that's a whole different rant, but, right. um, but I, I got, I helped BZ to commit to doing a, a whole program a couple of weeks ago. And apparently it's had an effect. Um, the governor has, I think put disabled people now on the one B tier, if I understand right. And as vaccines roll out, then there'll be a lot more attention to get getting them to disabled people who have been locked away since day one and are at such high risk, no matter what the age. So I've been very angry about how we've been treated. But right now I'm until the variants come get me. I'm almost, almost safe ish, ish. I wish all you guys luck. I hope the pointy things get stuck in your arms very, very soon. Reva, this has been so wonderful. I was really looking forward to speaking to you. Um, and again, I can't rave about the book enough. It is an art book. It's a biography I or autobiography. I think this book will be taught in schools or assigned as reading in colleges. Um, I just, it's remarkable and it's all a testament to you. Um, really, um, 
really great. Brave, yeah. daring, um, painfully honest. Uh, it was really, it's a, it's wonderful. So, um, and I, funny, funny also. There are lots of funny parts in it. Thank you. I, I, it's nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. And the big reason that I hope that it, um, that it wins is that books about disability really struggle. And um, I looked at the years, uh, the long lists for almost all the awards and all the best of lists for like the New York Times and the Post and LA, you know, LA Review and blah, blah, blah. I wanted to see how many books about disability had gotten on any of the lists. And it was pretty much um, Michael J. Fox's fourth memoir about having Parkinson's and a book by a friend of mine um, called What Can a Body Do that's about sort of uh, accommodation, conceptual accommodation uh, for disabled bodies, but it's not, um, yeah, that, and that's it out of the thousands and thousands of books that came out last year and that are on all these lists, that was pretty much it. So every book about disability that does well at all opens the door for the next ones. And that is what I want. I want this book to be an open door for the people who are with me now and coming next. And that was why you were so generous in donating uh, the 10 copies of the book, um, of your book to people who were thrilled to receive it. And um, yeah, I just think you're amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Abidor Evanston, for sponsoring this wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you, Levy Senior Center Foundation. Thank you, everyone who listened uh, and who continued to listen, even though you were upset that I was talking too much. Um, but it was a conversation that we'd intended. So um, it was my pleasure. Um, Riva, I will send you all the comments and the questions that we didn't have to get to. There are lots of personal notes to you. And um, it was just Thank really you. a fascinating discussion. So everybody stay safe, be well. You too. And um, thank you so much. This has been such an honor. So bye, everyone. Thank you so much. It's been our honor. Uh, next week, we have uh, Rich Lindbergh talking about uh, hidden stories of Chicago. Uh, those of you who love local history will love this uh, discussion and his presentation. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you next week.